we will just wait for participants to join in as a lot of them are joining in. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to RHP and iCynthia navigating the property market during the new normal webinar. And I'm joined by esteemed uh, panelists from RHP as well as Edmund Tyen Company and iCynthia. Uh, my name is Prashant Saxena. I look after insights at iCynthia. And without further ado, let's start with our panelists today. We will get into the agenda and there's a lot to share in terms of insights, take your questions, etc. So today I have with me Sherry and Suresh from RHP, Alice from Edmontine Company and Arun, who is from iCynthia, representing us as an analyst. So Sherry, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. I'm also very honored to be uh, one of the speakers among the panelists. Uh, I hate the product uh, management for deposits, loans, and payments in RHP Bank. I have uh, over 27 years of experience in mortgages as well as in the real estate industry. And I think this is a very good uh, time for us to actually get to the basics and fundamentals that is driving the market, as well as the impact of this uh, COVID on the property market. So I'm very keen to hear uh, the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Hi, uh... uh, Suresh? Yeah, hi, my name is Suresh. I run the rates and FX strategy for RHP Banking Group. Uh, what's really interesting about Singapore property market these days is actually interest in the extremely low levels. So this webinar would be actually walking you through what our thoughts on interest rates as well as actually how the prices in property markets in Singapore are going to be. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Alice? Hi, Alice. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Alice. Um, I'm from uh, Edmonton and Company. I've been covering research and consulting uh, for more than 10 years. And I also have experience in the construction industry. Very honored to be invited by RHB Bank to give a sharing about private residential market, which is one of the hottest topics and a uh, key topic of interest amongst uh, many investors, especially Singapore home buyers. And let's go to Aaron. Hi everyone, this is Arun. I am the Regional Analytics Manager for Insights in, in Asia and I, at iCentia. I specialize in analyzing uh, social media conversations and I, aiding business uh, business managers making day-to-day -day decision making. Uh, so. Thank you, Arun. So welcome again, panelists, and welcome our audiences. Currently, I see about 46 odd audiences uh, joining us. And we typically see over the next five to 10 minutes, more people will join. So welcome everyone. So let's get into the agenda. And over the next one hour, we'll be looking at what's happening now in terms of understanding the private property landscape. And this will be all about asking the right questions with our panelists. And some of them might be on top of your mind. Is it the right time to buy? Or should I wait even further? Or should actually have I missed the bus? And what kind of impact on interest rate has COVID uh, made for our economy? After understanding the present, we will move into the future. And this will be all about the factors that will impact the property market, especially focusing on prices and interest rates. And are they changing? Will they change? And what should we take out of it? And finally, we'll take in some audience questions with the panelists answering those questions focusing primarily on what decision should we be making when it comes to private property purchases or taking loans during the new normal. So welcome again, and let's start getting to the webinar. So going to the first topic, which is all about understanding the current property landscape. 
and everyone is talking about should I be waiting or is it the right time to buy? Have I missed the bus? What should I be thinking about when it comes to private property? So let's go to Alice and let's start to talk about what is their observation. Um, this market has been pretty interesting, especially in the last 20 years where Singapore has undergone um, tremendous economic growth um, right after the announcement of the two integrated resorts. And since then, we have gone through major cycles. And looking at the last six months, especially since COVID-19 pandemic started, um, it will be worthwhile for me to go through with all of you how has been the transactions and performances for private residential market. It's a market where both local and foreign investors can come in. And it is actively traded. And despite um, ups and downs of the market, uh, most of the investors will still look at residential property keenly. And therefore, uh, we see it very appropriate to share on private residential market with all of you today. And in light of the pandemic, where we are really living in a new normal, what could be the potential shifts in terms of expectations of a new home, which could influence the nature and types of uh, residential markets, uh, properties types that will be of interest to home buyers. So uh, let me take you through on the whole cycle of how the private residential market has been performing. Um, this is a cycle for the last uh, 23 years. And for those who still remember what happened during the Asian financial crisis, which started in July 1997, we saw many um, equity markets in Asia uh, having taken a beating, and likewise for private residential market as well. It has declined by 37% since July 1997 and over five quarters. But the recovery was uh, stronger by 40% over six quarters. And from um, the start of the millennial, 2000 to 2006, our property residential market has been trending sideways. Um, especially since um, we were living in a new normal of uh, heightened security checks in the aftermath of the terrorist attack in the US. Um, if uh, we could still recall back then, um, since the terrorist attack happened, we are all undergoing very stringent checks around the world at airports. So this also in, uh, influenced market sentiment where there's a bit of a fear factor due to terrorist attacks. And our residential market has declined by 20% over the course of almost six years. Um, it's a long time and market was hovering sideways. And that's where our Singapore government is thinking of ways to spur the economy. And around late 2006, they start to launch the two integrated resorts for development. And that actually spurred uh, a lot of uh, international interest where investors, be institutional or retail investors, they start to look at Singapore more keenly. And on top of that, there was a shortage of public and private residential supply. And with the influx of demand, demand has outstripped supply and that has led to a 58% increase in prices. And that's also on the back of a robust global economy growth back then, just before the global financial crisis. And since 2007 and right to 2008, the global financial crisis broke out with the collapse of Lehman Brothers and prices declined by 25% for only four quarters and with interest rates hitting an all-time low due to the US Fed quantitative easing measures, this has led to a huge uh, uplift of our private residential market and prices has uh, not looked back since then. It has increased by 62% over 17 quarters. And that's also during the time, you know, that started from quarter two, 2009, all the way to quarter, end of quarter two, 2013 where we see this huge 62% increase. What has happened during that period? Uh, for those who track the private residential market very keenly, you may recall that we had eight rounds of property cooling measures, eight rounds. And that has failed to dampen the sentiment of home buyers. And we also saw government rolling out a lot of land supply to, in a bid to uh, moderate the prices through supply lag strategy. And has that, Cook the market? No, surprisingly, because of essentially interest rates. Because interest rates has helped to control mortgage costs. And secondly, uh, our economy was doing quite okay during that period. So there was a positive sentiment around from 2009 all the way to 2013. 
And the biggest effective cooling measure is the total debt servicing ratio framework that has capped the mortgage uh, limits for home buyers. And prices declined 12% very slowly actually over the last almost uh, four years. And markets start to turn a little at quarter two, 2017, with the relaxation of the seller stamp duty from four years to three years. And prices start to come back up again. And this is also on the back of uh, reducing unsold inventory and reducing supply. And that also propelled the market to, to be lifted. And thirdly, there is also rising interest from foreigners who start to come back again to the market because since the various round of cooling measures from 2011 to 2013, where there's additional buyer stamp duty on foreigners, they were holding back for a long time. I think they were holding back for as good as six years, you know, from 2011, since where there's a ABSD, all the way until 2017. And a lot of them start to get used to the cooling measures, especially the extra stamp duty. And also other markets in the likes of Hong Kong, Canada, Australia, they are also tightening measures on foreign home buyers. So this has also led to a shift of interest of these foreign home buyers to look at Singapore again. And now we are at the height of COVID-19 pandemic. How has the market been performing? Okay, let's go on to the next slide. And Thanks, I, think, yeah, I think this is what Aaron will share more about what's happening to the market sentiment on the ground? Yeah, uh, it was an interesting insight uh, uh, from, your, from your end, uh, showing how the in, uh, price index has evolved. So we also wanted to weave in uh, social media data uh, along with the insights which uh, Alice brought in. So what you see here are social, uh, on the left, the graph which shows is actually uh, social media conversations on each day, right from March uh, 1st, to uh, early June. So these conversations were collected from Singapore-based social media channels like Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, forums, and especially in forums uh, like Hardware Zone Forum, SG Talk, and uh, Reddit and all that. So um, if you notice the chart there, uh, the conversations around buying are actually on the rise towards the end of the uh, cycle, the whole uh, CB uh, circuit breaker or the COVID-19 cycle. So it's actually spiking towards the end. So it actually shows that more people are interested in or are uh, bringing back the interest to buying properties. So what were some of these conversations? So um, some of the conversations were around concerns. So concerns that uh, the market will collapse and uh, the prices will drop. And then uh, some netizens are also saying the opposite. The market will not collapse because the government will actually save the market from dropping uh, uh, completely. So I think these, uh, these concerns are uh, already answered by the insights which uh, Alice shared in her pre previous slide and in terms of uh, prices uh, that uh, the, market has, uh, the market shows uh, the, the trends in prices, yeah. And from Arun's slide on the spike in interest and bus, especially at the height of um, the circuit breaker, I think one important uh, metric to look at is unsold inventory. This is a statistic that our authorities don't really talk about it. They do mention, but they don't give the specific that statistics. So we project this in uh, this chart to show you that during the peak of the market, which uh, started right after quantitative easing and low interest rates in end 2009 to 2013, due to the influx of supply um, championed by the government's supply as well as collective sales, we saw a high unsold inventory of close to 50,000 unsold units. And that corresponds with high sales volume, where sales volume averaged about four to 5,000 per quarter. So that was a very active uh, uh, three years. And ev ever since TDSR started, and it, there were also measures um, restricting developers from actively um, developing residential, whereby there was this um, uh, cutback on um, policies that uh, disallow developers to sell their company shares, to divest, to divest their shares in holding residential property that has limited developers to do collective sales and also um, additional buyer stamp duty on developers who uh, fail to complete and sell their residential properties within five years from buying the land. So this has also curbed 
uh, reduction in private supply. So as both government and private sector reduce supply, we saw that unsold inventory has fallen all the way to below 20,000 in 2017, around 20,000 units. And that's also the start of the collective sales fever, where we start to see some private developers coming into the collective sales market, and that has led to somewhat a hurt, um, hurt trend where more developers start to come in. And it's also because developers are running very low on land uh, bank. They need to fill up their land bank with, um, and the only way, one of the limited ways they can partake in buying good quality, good, well-located sites is to participate in collective sales fever. So all the way until 2018, uh, we already have seen more than 80 over government and private land being sold, 80 over. And that will, inevitably lead to a high increase in unsold stock. But what's interesting is that despite the latest round of cooling measures in July 2018, where second-time home buyers has to pay extra 12% additional buyer stamp duty and foreigners have to pay 20%, while developers have to pay 25 plus 5% of additional stamp duty for the risk of um, developing residential, we still see a gradual reduction in unsold stock. And now we are about 30,000 unsold stock. And in fact, yesterday when government released the um, second half of this year's government land sales program, they also acknowledged that unsold inventory has come down by about 20% from uh, start of 2019 till now. And therefore they wanted to have a consistent supply of homes. So this also goes to show that there's actually steady demand for private homes. But that data is Q1 2020. Q2, the data will be out uh, next month, end of this month, and you'll be interested to see, see whether unsold stock will continue to drop. And I think the answer is yes, because there has been some sales actually being achieved in April and to June to date. Uh, next slide, please. So how has the sales performance been for new sale and resale for the last two months during the circuit breaker, April and May? When, you, when we look at the proportion of Singaporeans out of the overall, overall home buyer profile, Singaporeans still forms the majority of home buyers. PRs form about 13 to 16%. Foreigners is a far less proportion. And even though April saw only 500 over units, this is actually much lower, about 50% lower than the previous month in March. But in May, you start to see a slight uptick in sales volume overall. And the proportion of Singaporeans have increased to about 83%. And if we zoom into looking at prime districts, traditional prime districts in 9, 10, and 11, you will notice that the proportion of these home buyers into the traditional uh, prime districts has actually increased to 70% out of the overall transactions. It's a slight increase, but it also shows perhaps uh, the higher net worth, higher income home buyers starting to look at prime districts because as developers are more proactive in their marketing efforts, they are reaching out to home buyers, and uh, along the way, they, they actually lo launch a lot more units um, that's available for sale during the circuit breaker period that has also promoted the interest from home buyers to go into the traditional markets. Next slide, please. So before I take you through on some of the analysis by the three main market segments, uh, let me show you how does URA carve out the locations the core central region will comprise traditional prime districts of 9, 10, 11, downtown core, which is the CBD area, district two, as well as parts of district six and seven, which is the city hall and Boogie's Beach Road area. Rest of central region will be the city fringe that's outside of the core central region and outside central region is the suburbs. Next slide, please. So what do we see here for CCR, the core central area? Interestingly, you look at quarter one, transaction volume for new sale is at a very high level. This is due to some um, projects that's being launched and they receive very good uh, response. And this uh, one or two projects that receive very good response in quarter one is also mainly attributed to its affordable pricing, where there's this project in Bugis Beach Road area. It has managed to clock in more than 70% of units sold. And that's remarkable. Uh, that was before the social distancing and safe management, management practices start to come in on show flats. So there were a lot of home buyers rushing into the show flats. 
And following that, there were also one or two blockbuster projects. There's one project in the Newton area that they managed to launch just at the eve of circuit breaker starting. And that project has also received uh, more than 70 over units so in one weekend. So there is actually interest for projects that's well located and well priced. And that also led to a huge increase in transaction volume. However, sales price, if we just compare quarter one, prices have dropped by 11%. And, but that said, this is still very project specific. It depends on what are the projects being launched during that particular quarter compared to previous quarters. So in 2019, we actually saw more projects that is in real prime districts like 910 uh, with freehold tenures being launched. And therefore, their prices in 2019 was on the higher side compared to quarter one 2020. How about resale? Interestingly, resale prices are still very stable. It has increased by 5% on a year-on-year -year basis in quarter one. Quarter two data is still incomplete, but we still uh, show you how has been the transaction volume so far, where it's based on caveats lodge. That's where an option is being issued. Next slide, please. How about the city fringe area? City fringe prices for new sale projects has been holding up as well, six over percent. And even when you look at quarter two so far, prices are still almost the same as quarter one. For resale, prices are fairly stable, though we see a slight decline in quarter two in terms of average prices so far. Next slide. How about the suburbs? The suburb prices are also uh, trending healthily. In fact, we saw that in April and May 2020, there has been more mass market suburban private homes being sold, partly due to affordability and, um, and also partly due to the fact that home buyers are looking for bigger size units with the same price. So prices in suburban areas where their PSF is ranging between say a, a thousand or slightly below a thousand for resale and for new sale it ranges between say thousand three all the way to thousand seven they are able to achieve uh, a higher unit of space with with a lower price quantum compared to cd fringe homes and that actually allude to the fact that home buyers are looking for space and also affordability especially during the circuit breaker and people are starting to look at mass market homes in a bigger way Therefore, we saw that prices has, is trending up, in fact, even for quarter two. As for resale, prices are still remaining stable, although there's a slight drop by 1.4%. Next slide, please. How about in terms of uh, sales take up for both, uh, for this is for new sale properties, you will notice that there's a general trend or bigger proportion of uh, units being sold that is either less than 500 square feet, these are the shoebox size units, but the biggest proportion lies between 500 to 700 square feet. And this is mainly for uh, one plus one or two bedroom type of unit types. And in terms of uh, 700 to 1000, this is also a size that, that is ranging from two to three bedroom size. Uh, they form the next uh, biggest uh, uh, proportion of units that's being well received. And for 1000 to 1005 square feet, in fact, we start to see a gradual increase in proportion now from in the past 17 to 18% proportion is now 19% proportion for quarter four last year to quarter one 2020. Next slide, please. How about looking at prices in terms of um, prices that is more well received? The sweet spot price still remains at one to 1.5 million. And if we look at the three market segments, in the city fringe, as well as the suburban areas, it forms 43% to, to 46% respectively. In terms of less than 1 million, there's still a huge proportion, even for mass market. As you can see, in quarter 4, 2019, it's 38%. And in quarter 1, 2020, it's another 37%. That also goes to show that perhaps mm. there's been greater interest for smaller units, mainly for rental you play, and also, it could be also due to shrinking household sizes, where there are more uh, smaller households and they can stay in smaller units. So these two um, trends could allude to still a high proportion of uh, shoebox units being translated, even for the suburban location. Interestingly, in quarter one, we can see that one to 1.5 million proportion 
has uh, increased tremendously for CCR areas as well. Because traditionally, CCR areas for the prime districts, they have prices crossing 1.5 to 2 to 2 to 3 million. It's between 1.5 to 3 million. And now we are seeing a huge proportion, a huge shift to 1 to 1.5 mil. Although it is spurred by mainly one and two projects, but that also is a telling trend. It also shows that there's a gravitation towards affordability due to also the weakening economic sentiment that we are facing now. Thank you, Alice. And that was quite in-depth uh, analysis of the private property market. Thanks, Arun, for bringing in social media insights on top of the analysis that we have on real estate insights. So it's a very good way in which we are understanding the market trend as well as organic consumer demand coming from social conversations. We will look forward to some of your insights in the next section again. All right, so let's start to get into uh, what interest rates are you thinking about? And after we have understood that how is the traction around the private property market in terms of the major events that have been impacting, how you're looking at various sizes or various property types and how the various statistics really impact. Now let's start to look into buying and how interest rates for mortgage are being impacted and did COVID have any impact on it? So bringing it back again, Alice, what do you think about the liquidity here? Uh, it is indeed interesting, especially ever since uh, we noticed that uh, from the global financial crisis onwards, in fact, at every major crisis, we saw a huge change in interest rates. And now we are living in the era of low interest rates. And this is uh, compared against a huge increase in money supply in circulation. And is that it's directly or inversely correlated where when there's more money supply, we see um, a dip in interest rates. So I'm also very curious about whether interest rates will further be lower for longer. Will it be lower for longer? What do you think, Arun? Yeah, um, so we also wanted to see what people are thinking. Uh, in, in terms of social media data about interest rate. Um, and again, you see a similar graph to the one which I showed you earlier, just that now the conversations are plotted based on loans and interest rates. So if you see towards the end, again, the peaks are happening towards the later half of the COVID-19 timeline. Uh, otherwise, it's been consistent, but there are big peaks around interest rate conversations. So what were some of these conversations about? Yes, uh, many netizens actually noted that the interest rate acknowledged also that interest rate is lower. Uh, but some of the concerns were that uh, this uh, uh, drop in interest rate could be short term. And there were concerns on uh, bad economy in the future and a higher unemployment rate, or even if uh, they don't lose their jobs, what is going to be their salary? Is it going to be the same or is it going to be lower? So um, there is actually a concern whether they will be able to pay back their loans, which they took up. And uh, there's also um, concerns around foreign talents uh, leaving Singapore because of job losses, who primarily form the audience for the rental property market. So the owners who want to rent the house and uh, get some investment out of that are also concerned around that. Yes, and, and that speaks very well because what we saw earlier was that there has been a dip in the private property from a corner point of view. So the demand for both rent as well as buying has slightly reduced. And it brings to a very good point, which Alice was talking about earlier, that look, interest rates are really low, demand is surging. We are seeing from social media data that there are peaks happening. Boils down to consumer confidence and also some sort of anticipation and speculation around what will the foreign talent be looking at here. So I want to bring in Sherry and Suresh here from RHP Bank in terms of the interest rates. So what do you guys think? I, I, I think that, you know, given the fact that uh, interest rates are extremely low and interest rates being a component in decision making of buying a property, this is actually quite attractive uh, proposition at this point of time because given that interest rates are low, people tend to... Uh, use that actually to their advantage by getting into a property itself. Now, on the second part of it actually, which uh, Arun was indicating that actually there were concerns that loss of jobs and unemployment. I mean, I, I think that given the fact that interest rates are low, 
uh, you may be able to remortgage if you have an existing property to buffer up some of your income on the back of that and use that to chase a new property if you can actually because you know the, the, the key component of property prices which is interest rates which is really pretty low but that said as well we envisage that you know interest rates actually will progressively go up but not to the levels that you think it's going to be a hindrance for you from chasing a property but it will naturally go up in tandem with actually expectations of economic activity picking up in Singapore, as well as actually COVID um, tapering off uh, over the next few quarters itself. So if, if you ask me, actually, it's, it's a good time to get into the property market because uh, one of the key components actually which is interest rates is at extremely low levels. And you've got enough liquidity into the system as well, which actually makes it a very attractive proposition now to get into the market. So, so here's where I would jump in. Uh, if you look at the chart, historically, cyber rates have been very low from 2008 late uh, to 2018. It has been all time low below 1%. But I think the COVID uh, scenario is very different from the earlier chart that Alice has shared, whereby uh, the shocks you see in the system is actually pretty short term and it's not as wide ranging as what you see currently, which is actually a worldwide impact. So the interest rate scenario may be low uh, for the next maybe six quarters, but I think that uh, we would still uh, urge uh, our customers to be uh, prudent when it comes to actually getting into a big ticket item like a property, because you never know uh, what would happen. Uh, the world is a little bit uncertain at the moment, so I think what is important is aside from interest rates, you need to look at your own uh, cash flow and your liquidity position. That is to say that if you do have excess uh, funds where you do not uh, really need it and you have the capacity to actually continue your earnings, then I think uh, you know, if you have not over geared on properties, mainly not buying more than uh, maybe a couple of properties, I think it is important uh, I think a consideration for you when you actually get into property purchases. And for those who have actually a loan right now, I agree totally with Suresh that this is the right time for you to look at the market and see whether you already have a chance or an opportunity to move to a lower interest rate. And that depends on a few things where mortgages are concerned. Firstly, to look at whether you are still within a lock-in and that lock-in could be uh, a lock-in based on your interest rates or could be based on the uh, fact that you have taken subsidies from the uh, financier that you had financed the loan with. Secondly, I think you need to ask yourself whether you know, you'll be holding on to this property for the long term or if you would likely be able to sell it off later or you may have cash that you want to use to offset or pay off your loan. So this is quite important when you come to refinancing your uh, property. And I think you would consider whether if, let's say you're going to take it for the long term, it's a property you're staying in, then you may want to consider uh, you know, having fixed lower rates. But fixed rate packages tend to come with a premium because banks, as usual, as you know, they already know how, or rather they factor in how long the rates going to be low. And therefore, they will actually charge a slight premium above the floating rate packages. So it's important for you to make this consideration when you are actually looking at mortgages. And my take is that you need to be very careful when you get into mortgage uh, or property purchase, because essentially it is a long-term uh, commitment and you really need to look at your uh, financial capabilities before you go into it. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you, Suresh. Now, after lots of charts and analysis, which was really a good way of putting a good platform here, that where are we heading towards? Now we'll get into some crystal ball stuff. And this will be all about what do we think as experts on what does future entail for us? We'll specifically talk about the factors that will impact the property market. And then we'll move on to the prices and interest rates and how they are changing. Just to give you guys an indication, we have 71 participants totally hooked on to this. We had about 100 plus people joining as an RSVPing us and it's 70% interest rate. So this looks like a topic which everyone is thinking about. And thanks Alice and Arun for your insights because that's keeping the engagement rates high. All right, now crystal ball stuff. So let's get into the future and let's talk about the factors. 
Now I'm going to open this discussion up. Let's start to free roll and let's start with uh, probably RHP Bank on what factors are you thinking of impacting the property market? So maybe I jump into this. Um, to me, I think what is important is the price of the property uh, that is being sold. Uh, as well as uh, the fact that uh, the interest, the low mortgage interest rate does help a lot because it actually is one of the key factors that any purchasers will look at, right? And the other thing that is important, if you are buying for investment, meaning you already have a property, then I think you need to look at whether you think this investment property you are buying is likely to enable you to get some rent in between. So as what we have just now said, we do see expatriates leaving, uh, moving out of Singapore. So this is an area that you need to be very prudent about because you need to be able to have some cash flow to offset the mortgages, right? Of course, on the other balance, you will also see that if you buy a property at a price that you deem to be quite uh, reasonably low, then the property price gain is something that you can look into. And as usual, those people who have the cash, who have the holding power will always win hands down when it comes to properties because they can always buy at the low and they can wait till the high because they have deep pockets to hold on and then they sell Bye. at the price. Don't you agree with me, Alice? Yeah, Sherry, your point about um, price and also cash flow, um, this is a very important factor and therefore that differentiates how different property types, you know, uh, be it high-end, mass market or city fringe homes, be it new sale or resale, will fit into the strategies of every single buyer. So perhaps I can um, distill into two, three areas of uh, consideration. Um, this is on the backdrop of the fact that how the economy will pan out. Uh, we, I think from the views that we have read from various economies and even international bodies around the world, this year is going to be a challenging year with uh, likely a washout in terms of recession all around. So in light of that, I would think interest rates will continue to remain low, right, <laughs> Shoresh? So yeah. maybe Shoresh can talk more about that interest rates. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 think, I think actually there is what Alice and uh, Shelly is indicating. But, you know, Alice, you made a good point there. It's actually how the economy performs. Uh, if you look at the region itself, uh, Thailand is expected to go into technical recession. Singapore is also expected to be in a recession. Indonesia barely getting out of recession actually this year. Malaysia possibly also in recession. But, you know, given those situations, actually, when you have recession, and, and it comes back to that slide that we showed earlier during the Asian financial crisis, there was also a time when actually property market prices came off. But on the high side of this, actually, we have to bear in mind that COVID-19 is a health crisis rather than a financial crisis. So if you look at it from a financial market's perspective, you have interest rates which are pretty low. At the same time, also, actually, it's quite advantageous for people who are interested in properties. Uh, secondly, it's also actually the only variable which I would say is the outlying at this point in time is actually the job losses and the concerns of actually anything that's related to services and the job losses in this area is impacting the economy. And you know, Singapore has, is, a, is an economy that's driven by financial services as well as actually other services and tax. So my only concern is actually if people are facing job losses and then they also have a mortgage to pay and then they have also low interest rates, the only ability to take advantage of that, I would say, what Sherry said earlier, is there's a possibility of you mortgaging your existing property to get some extra cash. But if you have fully made your payments and uh, you have got a job loss, and then you also have another property, you probably can actually see, sell it off and get into a cheaper market, actually, given that actually property prices are pretty much actually going to go up in the next few years, is what you mentioned earlier. So I think actually it's a shift of your portfolio of your wealth in this challenging period, taking advantage of your low interest rate. That's, that's what I'm looking at it from that perspective. Yeah, Suresh, I think on your point on low interest rates, which is going to like likely continue, I was looking at your chart just now on your forecast for interest rate, and it's likely to remain low for the second half of this year, all the way to maybe first half of next year. So for from now to first half of next year, my view is that while the market is going to be rather soft in terms of a lack of a bullish uh, sentiment, it is actually a good time to look at property because this is when um, I think the sellers are more open 
to negotiate with you in terms of their price offers. That's one. So while they are more willing to talk to you, to talk to you as a buyer, it's actually a good time to, to lock in at a good price and, and at low interest rates. Yeah, and second, yeah. yes, that's right. And secondly, mm, because there's going to be less launches actually this year, uh, especially for second half, uh, unless there are some developers who are still willing to try, uh, try it out in the second half of this year. But because there's going to be slightly less launches this year, activity is going to be slower. That will also mean that the existing projects that's already being launched will start to see their sales being hard down. So these developers will also feel um, slightly more comforted that their units are being sold. Although slower, but at least there's movement. So there's less competition for new sales projects this year because second half, we might not see many new launches to be launched this year. So there's less competition, especially in the new sales market. But in terms of resale, we might see some sellers more willing to talk to buyers as well. Um, if the economy continues to weaken, especially on jobs, uh, as Suresh mentioned. So we could see a rise in mortgage sales, which is the auctions market, where um, home, some of the homeowners may see pressure in um, fulfilling their mortgage payments. And with mortgage sale, with more mortgage sale, will there be also more interest in auctions? The answer is yes, more people will look at mortgage sale. But at the same time, as home buyers are looking around for different sources of properties, after they look at mortgage sale, they will start to increase their expectations on the homes that they want to look for. And inevitably, as they move from mortgage sales, they will also look at resale and they will look at new sale. And new sale has a certain appeal because it is a new built product. Um, it, a few years ago, where I used to do a sentiment survey study, we noticed that Singaporeans actually like new homes. They like it because it's new, that's one. Secondly, they like the, the design being new. And they also want to take advantage of a low, lower mortgage payouts during when the project is under construction. So it helps to hatch in terms of their payments uh, for mortgages until TOP. So after TOP, some of them will quickly sell off uh, as long as they clear the three years seller stamp duty. That depends on the buyers uh, or, or rather the investor's objective. Some of them may choose to stay. Uh, I, in fact, I'm one of them. My project TOP, I stayed and I love it and I start to like new projects. So that also goes to show that there's an interest for both new sales, especially those who like new projects. They want to hatch with lower mortgage payments during the projects under construction. There will be some who like to re look at resale because of immediate needs. They need to move in and, and, and get, um, get to stay or get rental income immediately. And also some of them may want to look for bigger spaces for older projects where the layout is bigger. And now because of COVID-19, we also notice that home buyers are likely to look for projects that has more space. And they need to have spaces such as study areas, even if there's no study room, at least a study area where you can enclose, you can do a nice Zoom discussion like what we're having here. And nice uh, recreational areas. And I think some home buyers will start to appreciate balconies where they can get to have a reprieve from spending long hours working in the study area at the balcony to do their exercises and all. And there will be also gravitation towards projects where there's uh, amenities around them. So there's this talk about whether home buyers will be interested in decentralized areas where there's regional centers, there's a lot of amenities around their homes. Um, I would think, yes, there could be a stronger movement towards decentralization, partly also because um, suburban projects tend to be of a lower price and they could also enjoy access to parks and gardens. I think the accessibility to these green areas are quite important, especially in the post-COVID era. I think our love for greenery will increase even more after this COVID subsides. Yeah, so these are my prognosis of what I think could happen. But having said that, there's another important point, which is my fourth point is, will foreign investors start to come back? And the foreign investors tend to look at prime districts because they're very used to prime districts. It's a sign of prestige, as well as uh, they want to live among their friends. I think with the macroeconomic events that's happening right now, there's a good chance that Singapore is going to absorb 
uh, more foreign investors once we uh, once our pandemic is over, when travel restrictions are gradually lifted. And as they come to Singapore, they will look at high end first for especially for the high net worth uh, investors. And that's where I see that there's also demand for high end. Very valid points, Alice. Nice. Uh, that reminds me of uh, how consumer behavior is changing in these times, right? So uh, it's quite psychological to think that we are able to envisage our dreams and our needs in the current situation. Uh, just want to go back to Sherry. Uh, Sherry, would you have any thoughts on this? I think the part about new properties is quite interesting because basically uh, I agree totally that the cash flow uh, position is much better. And in essence, uh, especially for RHB, right, we do have a, a home plus package that goes with all our loans where the customer can even enjoy lower interest rates because of the fact that they put deposits with us. So in a case where the property is fairly new and is progressive disbursement, the customer can actually really uh, take, make full use and take the best advantage of the package because an interest rate of let's say 1.35% could end up the customer being paying only 0.35% uh, because of the fact that he has a home plus uh, feature in his package. And I think the important part for all home uh, purchasers and owners is the fact that they, uh, they want to be able to have some control over their interest rates. So uh, if let's say you can actually manage that, uh, not just relying on fixed rates, but also be able to uh, use your own cash to offset some of the interest that you are paying off uh, to lower the interest on your mortgage, I think that will help all the home purchasers and owners in a time like this. Uh, and I think it is true that um, it, is a, it is actually a very opportune time for most buyers because interest rate is really very low now. Thank you, Sherry. And uh, that's a very valid point. And let's move on to the next section because I'm sure with so much analysis and experience in this panel, uh, we have 73 odd people thinking and looking about buying their first property or subsequent ones. So I'll take in the first question from the audience and I would ask audience to start typing their more questions because it's not every day that you have such a good mix of panel talking about data insights as well as experience. So the first question comes about, and I'll read it as it is. There seems to be still a pent up demand for properties, but people are still holding back because of current uncertainty. We talked, talked about it just now. Do you think these potential buyers will be making a move in the next six to 12 months, assuming COVID somewhat stabilizes? So what about the next six to 12 months? Oh, have a go. Go ahead. I think the next six months is very critical, in my opinion, because we have to see the extent of our economic fallout arising from COVID-19 pandemic, not just on Singapore, but also around the world. I think the statistics that's going to come forth in the second half, such as job losses, um, salary cuts, um, it sounds morbid, but it's true. You know, all those things are coming uh, progressively. And how will uh, home buyers or investors able to uh, withstand this um, thunderstorm. I would think that, um, firstly, the outlook may not as be not may not be as dire as it is because our government has launched four rounds of budgets and they have done all they could to prevent massive job losses. So I think that is a very big uh, booster to the economy. And especially for local home buyers, because uh, a lot of the packages are budget packages are supporting local employment. So this will actually help local home buyers to still secure their jobs. Um, and the next question would be: Should they buy now? Should we should we really buy now? Now, uh, I would agree with what Sherry has shared earlier on: is really working out your cash flow, your financial position, and what kind of uh, mortgage loans. Uh, payout are you able to stomach? So I think for those who is having uh, higher budgets and higher cash flow financial position, actually they are in a very good position to buy property now because while prices are starting to moderate for some projects and also for resale as well, it's a good time. So I think those who have deeper pockets may come in actually in the second half of this year. 
So next next half of next year, we, we hope the economy will rec recover uh, early next year. And if that happens, then more people will come in, then there'll be more projects. So we could see a uh, return in activity at the start of next year, optimistically. So I think uh, whether, we are, whether people will start to come in now or, or later, it will really depend on the investors' ability to invest. And what if people want to wait it out till 2021 and think of 2022? There will be likely some buyers who, who maybe they need more time to build up their investment um, investment um, war chest, so to speak. Um, for those who are not so um, bullish to come in, they can still wait until next year. Um, but it's good to keep a watch on how are interest rates moving as well, because if interest rates start to climb back again, then it will be at a slightly higher uh, mortgage cost. And secondly, it's also how will um, the sales volume improve? Because as the economy starts to see some light of a recovery and more buyers are coming in, there's more sales take up, that will also lift up prices um, in terms of a recovery path in 2020, uh, 2021. And thirdly, our, most of our developers are quite strong in terms of their cash flow position. They are actually able to wait out and for them to drop prices tremendously, it is not quite likely at this moment because a lot of them are reputable developers. They are able to hold out their prices. Mm. Next, yeah, I agree with Alice. Uh, I agree totally with Alice because right now, the interest rate environment doesn't just only play out to the end consumer who's buying properties, but it also play out to big corporations. Mm. So, for example, uh, big companies like CDL, Far East Organization, they actually will have a, a big uh, opportunity to lower their costs. And if they can hold on to the lower the lower cost, right, then they will be able to take the time to sell. Of course, uh, you know, the government has also given a slight reprieve to all the developers. So that is important. Yeah. Uh, if I would just like to add in a bit, uh, I think I think the basic question that actually everyone needs to know is actually saying the basic necessities in life is food, clothing and shelter. And Singapore is an island which has got very limited space of land. Now, the rule of thumb that I would take into account is actually if prices are coming down below 10% or even close to 10%, it'll be a reflective of a recovery in the next six months. If it's coming down more close to 15%, then it'll be actually uh, a question of actually supply of new residential properties, as what Alice has indicated, which is going to be less in the second half. If it's anything more than 20%, then it's likely that actually prices are coming down because it's a crash. But bear in mind that actually the Singapore is founded, the basic tenor it was founded was actually every Singaporean has to have a roof over their head. So which means actually it is very unlikely that prices crashed on significantly. The most actually uh, would be probably a 10 to 15% decline. But the question is actually when the timing that it costs. I really think you can't find a bottom for it, but if you actually stick to the to the narrative that actually is Singapore is small, it's got land scarce, prices are still on the upward trend, any time is actually a good time. But the only good factor here is actually interest rates are pretty low and that plays very much in favour of the buyer at this point. Valid point, Suresh. In fact, uh, just to extend on the crash that you were talking about, there is a question that do you have, in case a crash happens, then uh, do you have any thoughts on commercial or industrial properties? Just a very quick one. I think for commercial properties right now, uh, retail is going through a very tough time because of the circuit breaker, lack of tourist arrivals. So a lot of retailers are feeling the tremendous heat. So I see a downside risk for retail spaces, especially for strata retail. And um, unless the landlords are able to pivot very quickly to reach out to F&B players and uh, essential goods players, and to be able to capitalize on e-commerce. I think if they can do that, that could uh, enhance their chances of survival. And I would think that landlords may need to moderate their rental expectations, especially for this year, because it is an unprecedented year. And it will take some time for retailers to come back up again with new concepts. And, uh, and my view is that such recovery will only happen early next year for retail. Industrial is doing well. Um, especially for certain sectors like warehouse, logistics. 
and um, and even high tech uh, players that takes part in biomedical. So when it comes to warehousing, due to e-commerce boom with circuit breaker, and also stockpiling, we start to see stable demand. However, rentals will likely moderate too because um, businesses are also trying to cut costs, trying to uh, keep cash, and therefore uh, landlords will also uh, could help them out in this uh, to to help everyone get through this period. Thank you, Alice. And in fact, we have lots of questions flowing in, so we may want to get into a little rapid fire round. In fact, people are also getting into a FOMO fear of missing out by asking us, is the recording going to be shared? Yes, it will be shared so that in case you miss one of those data points or one of those insights and experience sharing from our panelists, you can go back and refer to it. All right, so getting into the rapid fire round now, in this environment, and this is your crystal ball question, is there a golden ratio between cash flow versus mortgage? I mean, I would like to answer that actually. I think the, the key thing here is actually whether actually there's enough cash flow. The question is actually how do you feel job security in the first mm -hmm. place? And I think Singaporeans largely or generally, are, I, I've been working there for a number of years, so I, I know the psychology of most Singaporeans is that job losses is a big of a phobia actually. Yeah? It's a very big concern for many of them actually. Now, if you actually want to use that golden rule, actually, trying to find out actually which is better to hold now, the question is actually, are you having a cash flow of income the next few years? If you can afford to have another property or you have an existing property and you can manage that, then it's fine. But if you're very insecure with your job itself, then it's best that actually you just want to hold back. And if you have an existing property or an extra one, you can mortgage that with a low interest rate and use that cash flow itself. So these are actually pretty trying times. But for those actually who have not got a property actually, I think the most important thing is actually to take into account whether you have enough cash flow coming in and if your job security is in place. That's that's a key thing for us to look at before you can look into the golden rule. Yeah, I just want to add on to what Suresh has said. In actually on a regulatory basis, uh, for owner occupation uh, cases, uh, twenty percent must be paid upfront by the property purchaser. Right, and then the balance can be a loan. Uh, usually, uh, Singaporeans and Singapore PRs will tend to have a fair bit of money in their CPF accounts. So, the rule of thumb most people say is actually at least keep in your CPF account at least six months of your monthly installments so that you can actually um, stave off uh, any uh, temporary loss of job. But I think in this environment, it's safer to have at least. 12 months of uh, CPF funds that you can have uh, set aside. Um, the job part is actually the tricky one because really um, even let's say in today's environment, if let's say you uh, lost a job, right, uh, is how fast you get it back and at the, the, the pay that you are looking for. So that is actually also quite critical, which is why it's quite important to actually purchase within your means. And if you're looking at buying for investment, then I think it is safer if you know that you yourself have uh, maybe 50% of the property in some form of uh, cash or liquid enough uh, uh, cash, almost like stocks that you can sell off if you really need to and take a loan at roughly about 70%. And that would be I, the rule of like being prudent in terms of purchase. Good point, Sherry. In fact, uh, with so much government grants as well as the uh, push that's happening, uh, while there is a big move towards job security as well as creation of new jobs, it's also on individuals' responsibility to look at the cash flow, the next 12 months of CPF, and then make the call rather than try to hedge everything now. Alice? Um, I would think that... Um... It is important to indeed hold um, your cash flow for now, as and also at the same time, be um, proactive to look at you know, investment opportunities, uh, not just property as well, but also other liquid kind of uh, uh, investments where you can you can actually have a shorter term horizon. So I have seen some investors actually looking at investing in equities and bonds before putting their proceeds back into property. 
So we might see more of this kind of activity happening in the second half of this year. Because actually first half, ever since the pandemic occurred, the stock market um, moderated a lot and we saw a quick recovery against fundamentals. I think this is a sign. It's a sign that um, there's a lot of movement of monies around the system. And in fact, in 2009, after the global financial crisis occurred, and there was also a quick rebound in stock market. And what happens next? People rush to the show flat and buy property. So I guess there's this uh, movement of investment strategy from short term to long term play. So they, they earn their monies quick and they move into property so that it's a stable uh, asset of investment. Yeah, so I can see that maybe in the next six months we could see such activity happening. And secondly, uh, I saw one question about asking about general elections. Oh, which yeah. is like uh, it, it was my last question to uh, finish it, but I just want to bring in one more question here. Uh, okay, is, well, I'll hold on to that first. Yeah, yeah, the, we, we, we do that as our dessert. So let's get into the developer discount uh, at TOP period. Do you think it's a myth or fact? Just a quick one. I would think it's a myth because it all depends on how the developers strategize on their launches. Some developers are doing very well in clearing their inventory and especially the mass market ones are doing well recently even though they have a high number of units for their mega developments but at least it's moving quite fast and some developments although they are reaching they still have two more years to go you know to reach the five-year TOP period but they already crossed 70 percent of sales so I think such developers I don't think they are under pressure to uh, implement steep discounts during TOP period they still have time and the government also re recently extended their, their completion period by six months, partly because of the construction delay. And that helps them a bit, because actually six months is a short time. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's, still good. it's still good for them to breathe a little. All right, so let's get into the hot question as we wind up this webinar. Do you see elections impacting businesses and more importantly, property market? I think um, what really influenced the property sentiment will be, you know, policy as well as future development. I think we have a very strong ruling party right now, and it all depends on uh, how their performance is. But it's uh, of a general consensus that um, the current incumbent will continue to run the government after the elections. So it's likely that the policies that they have rolled out, especially national agenda development plans, for real estate, uh, be it developing CBD area, decentralized areas, as well as new growth areas. These plans are most likely going through because we really do have a stable government. And in light of that, the stability gives clarity to investors, be it institutional or retail investors. And this is good for the property market because when investors want to come in, they want to see certainty in future development plans. So the MRT lines, the Cross Island line, Jurong Region line will continue to be constructed. Yep. And with that, it will certainly help the property market sentiment and it will uh, lead to a long-term um, in interest towards uh, new growth areas in future. Thank you, Alice. Uh, let's wind this up. Quick 10 second, uh, maybe some tips for our audiences. Let's start with Sherry, 10 quick minutes, uh, 10 quick seconds. Uh, what do you think about just a tip to our audiences? Um, I think the key word I would like to leave with the audience and myself too is to is the word prudence. I think in any investment, whether it's property or stocks or shares, I think it's important to have uh, to be prudent about it to actually review your own uh, financial situation and capabilities and ensure that uh, you have sufficient uh, tenacity to hold on to the investment when you go into it. Thank you, Shari. Suresh? I would just say one thing, actually. Any time is a good time to begin in the property market, but it's a lot more sweeter when interest is pretty low. Thank you so much. Alice, let's find this out. I would think it's rigor, rigor in analyzing your financial position and seeking uh, professional advice. Um, no harm doing a detailed cash flow analysis gets professionals to help you so that you can see uh, what could be certain scenarios that you are able to stomach. I think that's quite important because we are really living in a new kind of new normal times. 
So it's um, more uncertain than before and it's going to be the new normal and therefore it is important to know your best case and worst case scenarios. Thank you, Alice. And thanks a lot uh, to our panelists, Arun, Shay, Suresh, Alice, for your valuable inputs and experience sharing. I hope uh, and I'm quite certain that our audiences have gained a lot and that's why they're overstaying for five more minutes. So thanks a lot, guys, for attending this webinar. And thanks again, panelists. We'll see you next Thank time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you.